Hey folks, and welcome to Winning Conversations. In today's episode, Dan and I sit down with Nikki Deaton, our pastor over Connect here at Heritage. We have a great conversation about ministry and passions and her life. Nikki has served at Heritage for three years. However, her ministry journey starts about 20 years ago in Michigan. She candidly shares what it's like to grow up as a pastor's kid or PK, and shares a bit of insight into her family and her current life here in Texas. Please sit back and listen as we dive into this conversation. How are you? Great. You doing good? Yeah. Yeah. Just let's just start at the beginning. Tell us, tell us a little bit about your experience. What was like growing up at church? Um, what was it like being a PK? I know that's a unique experience for a lot of people. So just tell us a little bit about, about your early years. Sure. Um, probably most people don't know. Um, my mom grew up Mennonite, which is like a cousin of Amish. So when we first started going to church as a family, we went to a Mennonite church. But then my parents, I mean, they weren't big into church. They had gone to church as kids, but they weren't really big into church. Probably when we were born, they started going to have us in Sunday school and stuff like that. Um, and it wasn't until I was five that my parents got saved. But when they got saved, they got really saved. They got turned on to God, believed in him, got filled with the Holy Spirit. So we started going. So since the time I was five, we started going to a Word of Faith church. And so I, and they grew up under the people like Hilton Sutton, Kenneth Copeland, Charles Capps, you know, all the greats that we've heard about in the Word of Faith. And so that's what I grew up under. Um, I loved it. And we were at church all the time. Um, my family, so my dad obviously didn't start out as a pastor. He started out, they started out serving the nursery. And then they worked in kids, they worked in youth, they cleaned up, they, you know, helped with events. And then eventually he moved into an assistant pastoral role. And um, it wasn't until I was, I think a year before high school, that he became a pastor. So um, I've seen, we were at the church all the time, you know, with Helps Ministry, you're there all the time. But we just worked right alongside mom and dad or played at the church. You know, you learn all the ins and outs of the church. You find out, uh, you know, how to fall into the lake next to the church and (laughs) (laughs) all those kinds of things. Plus, I had three sisters at the time. So um, I have my twin sister and two younger sisters. So uh, I'm sure we were a handful, but we were very adventurous. So we always found things to do while we were at the church and we had a lot of fun. We knew where all the crackers for communion were hidden. It's awesome. Things like that. Things PKs know. Yeah. And um, so I loved growing up as a PK. Um, when my parents became pastors, when I was older, um, you know, it was a rough road at first. They came into a church that already existed, but we would have never known it, that it was a rough ride. They didn't talk about it in front of us. You know, we were pretty um, oblivious to what was going on, but it was pretty rough for them for a few years. And um, I was, I don't know, I hear a lot of stories about PKs that, um, you know, they have a hard time. And I think sometimes the pressure maybe that churches or even your parents may be put on you causes some of that. But my parents never did that. Um, They just let us grow up, but they lived what they preached at home. You know, um, there wasn't anything at home going on that they weren't preaching at church. And so the love of God was in our home. So... I, you know, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Because my parents were so good at loving us, we loved them. So I would have never done anything to hurt my dad. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't one of those PKs that needed to go out and sow wild oats or anything like that. I don't believe any kid has to do that, that any right. kid that's filled with the Holy Ghost has to do that. And um, so I didn't. And I just, I just enjoyed it. I enjoyed being a PK, being at church all the time, and learning everything we learned. Do you think that your experience as a PK, preacher's kid, is unique? Or do you think that most people have homes that live live it in the pulpit and at home, like have pastors that do that? I think that's a good question. I think there's probably lots of pastors that do that and lots of kids like that. I think it's a shame we don't hear more of those stories. Yeah. You know, I think, so I don't, I don't think I'm unique, although maybe not everyone hears my story. Yeah, that's why we're doing. That's why we're having the conversation. <laughs> um, do you think? Do you think your sisters had a, would describe your experience growing up as the same in the same tone and light and love? Yeah, I think so. I think they would. Um, I think my youngest sister. You know, times change, and maybe they don't get um, harder, but we all know things are getting darker. So by the time we got to my youngest sister, she homeschooled for a few years, even though the rest of us, I mean, we had some, we had about two or three years in a Christian school, but when we moved um, and he took a pastor job, there wasn't a Christian school, so we were in public school. 
Um, but by the time my little sister came through the public system, by the fifth grade, my um, God actually spoke to my mom and said, if you don't get her out of the system, you're going to lose her. So she pulled her out, and I think she homeschooled her for a year or two years, and then she could put her back in, and then she was fine. But so it's just important, no matter, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, um, a nurse or a pastor, you've got to be listening to God for what to do with your kids. Um, we know you had a big transition here to, from Michigan, that's where you're originally from. Right. But um, tell us a little bit about uh, how you got to know Pastor Justin and Annette and what that was like. Okay. So we met pastors through Jerry Savelle Ministries International. Um, we had become partners with Jerry Savelle. We've been partners with them for a lot of years, and then we were invited to be a part of their um, president's cabinet, which is their mission support group. So when we came to Fort Worth for um, those president cabinet meetings, that's the first time we met Justin and Annette. And we, they asked us to dinner one night, and so we went out to dinner and just had a fabulous time with them. It was just like, you know, being with family. Just same, same heart, same mind. And um, so we didn't see them. We, I think we met them again. That would have been in like March of one year. We didn't meet them again until January of the following year. Wow. At the minister's conference at Kenneth Copeland. And so when we saw them there, we went to lunch again and just had a wonderful time. And um, then, you know, the president's cabinet came back up. So there was just a few meetings we had with them. But God just started knitting our hearts together. We started talking on the phone long distance or Skyping each other and um, FaceTiming each other. And just talking about ministry in general, praying for each other. You know, we just became fast friends. And uh, then they asked us to go to um, Kenya, Africa with them, which had always wow. been in our hearts to go. <laughs> and we had been to missions because in our church, um, my dad has been traveling to like the former Soviet Union since 1990, 1991. Wow. So we started going with him over there. So we've been to Ukraine and Russia, Siberia areas those kinds of things, but um, never to Africa. And that was really big in our hearts to go. But we didn't know anyone who went there in our sphere of people. And so um, when they asked us to go, we were a definite, we're in. And so that would be like a year later. They asked us like a year ahead of time. We're like, yeah, we're in. So that came around and we went on the mission trip with them and a team from Heritage. Oh my goodness, we had such a wonderful no, team. We want to hear about this. Such a yeah. wonderful time. So people, Deborah Young was on the trip and... Uh, Margie Gewen was on the trip and a bunch of people that, you know, that you would know that are here at the church. And we just had just the best time. So what we did, mostly when we went, we went to minister to um, the Kenya, like like what we would call an FCS here, Fellowship of Christian Students. Okay. So, but it was like the Kenya, Fellowship of Christian okay. Students. So that was really the plan. And then, of course, we ministered in the church, too, and we went out into the community. But that was, so we were going to three different camps, and they were pulling in all their leaders because the, in Kenya, the country actually supports that organization in their schools. Mm -hmm. So they took all of the top leaders in the Fellowship of Christian Students, and they brought them to camps. And then we came in to minister to them and to talk to them. And that was amazing. We saw all kinds of things. The ministry was great, and everybody ministered. Everyone ministered. Everybody had a part. Um, we saw we cast out demons. I mean, it was That's amazing. Legit ministry. Yes, yeah. it was. It, it was excellent. So, what happened with your relationship with pastors? Oh, out, so out from that trip, that just. I mean, I, not that our relationship wasn't already cemented, but that just cemented our relationship. I think that just knit our hearts together for ministry. I think it was soon after that that God started moving on Eric and I that we would, uh, I don't know, that a shift was coming, I guess you could say. Something was going to change. And not because we needed to be more busy or we weren't doing ministry where we were, because, were. I don't know, yeah, we yeah. were. We were the young adult leaders. We were the youth leaders. Um, Eric was the worship pastor. Um, I ran the you know, the pro presenter team, and I was the administrator of the church, and so we had plenty of responsibilities. We went into our local public school once a week and did three different Bible studies um, during the lunch hours of the three different, you know, middle school and right. high school, and so we had plenty to do, but yet we felt like there was something more that God was asking, going to ask us to do, which we had no idea what that was, so God started moving on our hearts on that. So a year before we came, um, we told pastors that we thought we were coming um but then we just we weren't sure when 
So by the time God really moved on our hearts to come here, we didn't tell pastors anything until a week. What? We packed everything. We packed up our whole lives. And a week before we moved here, we called pastors and <laughs> told them we were coming. Oh, my goodness. And we thought we thought God was sending us here to help. That's all we knew. We thought he was sending us here to help. And so um, we didn't know anyone. I mean, of course, we had met the Savelles at the President's Cabinet, but not to where, you know, we not had met the Joe and Joyce McCroskey over at JSMI, and who's the international director, and, and Pastor Justin Annette, and that was it. So we moved here. We moved to Burleson, um, got a rental house because we had no idea about the area. We had no idea what God had for us here. And we just started coming to church. <laughs> and so uh, that was quite an experience. Getting to know everybody was a lot of fun. I love how you call them pastors. Like there is no, there's no separation of church and state here. <laughs> like, like, it's like, uh, yeah, Pastor Justin, Pastor Nanny. He's like, pastors. I, I, I think that's awesome that you say that. Um, was it a, a fun season? I, I know, because we're, my wife and I just recently moved here. And so we went from a, a leadership, committing a lot of time to the church, doing a lot of things to just kind of receiving. And it sounds like you did the same thing. You got here and just went from admin, went from all these different hats you had to wear. And for people who don't ever serve in churches, it can get busy, it can get a lot of things, but it's kind of unique to go and just sit and be fed, just receive. Sure. Kind of take, and what was that like coming here? Yes, if you ask Eric, it was, he was fidgety. <laughs> really? I mean, we got here, we unloaded the truck, put everything in the house, and had nothing to do because we weren't working here. Mm -hmm. You know, Eric still had his business in Michigan, so it was like, it, in in one week's time, my whole, whole house had everything in its place, <laughs> and we were sitting on the sofa twiddling our thumbs like, what do we do now? <laughs> this is so weird. So, um, it was definitely, I, I'd say, um, a growth experience on patience and waiting on God because you just yeah you're like you just said you go from doing all this kind of mystery and then you're like what are we supposed to be doing is there something we're supposed to be doing right now but it was it was great just to come in and um love people mm -hmm. love on people with no you know you're just a normal human being loving on people you know you're not loving me because you're my pastor you're not no loving me because be. you have to you know so they get to know you at that level of just who you are you know and uh, so that was great but the the waiting was it was definitely harder for Eric than it was <laughs> was for me um but it was good so about six months in Dr. Chevelle asked to meet with us and so we went to JSMI and we met with him and he pretty much sat us down he's like so what are you doing here and we looked at him and said, well, we thought you, what did we say? Something like, we thought you would be able to tell us. All three uh, of us busted out laughing. And um, so he said that he thought he knew why we were here, but he wasn't at liberty to tell us at that point. And we just, so we started laughing again because we're like, what, what does that mean? And does that mean we go back to the house and do nothing again? So we just laughed, and but then he asked us to come and start working at JSMI and just helping out in the executive office there, helping him and the international director. And so that's what we've been doing ever since. And then about um, three months later, that's when Pastor Justin approached us and asked if we would join the executive team at the church and um, just help with missions and, you know, just be a support in, in the pastoral staff room, you know, um, praying for them, supporting them, you know, um, just praying as we get direction for the church. And then, of course, he asked me to take over um, Connect, which was serve teams, helps teams, you know, things like that. So I want to tell you one of the first moments that you made a huge impact on my life. And it was, it was, so I would come here, Sho and I, my wife, and, and, you know, and I had never seen you get up and preach or, or speak, but you had this one night, you said something that just resonated with me so deeply. It was a, the most human moment. When you got up there, you said, I have to pray before I do announcements because, like, public speaking is not your thing. And so, quick backstory: like, my wife and I helped, or I helped plant a church in San Diego, and it was a small church. And then, you know, my pastor came up to me one day and was like, hey, can you do the opening prayer? You know? And I was like, panic mode. I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> The pressure of that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like it, my world was like, this is a very serious thing. 
Like, I need to, like, literally pray the Spirit into this place before, you know, right. there's only 50 people here. It wasn't like, you know what I mean? Like, and I knew all of them. And I was, like, just in the back, just, like, hand in head, like, hands just in my head, like, praying, all right, Lord, please give me your words, give me your, give me your spirit. I, I need to, you know, there's so much on this. And so when you said that just doing the announcements, like, you are just, like, I need to bring this to prayer. I need to bring this to God. I was, it was the most human moment of, like, the reality of, like, everything you said past that then made so much more sense, mm. if that makes sense. Like, right. I was like, the seriousness of what it means to get on that pulpit, the seriousness of what it means to, to present to people, like, hey, this is our announcements, but this isn't just announcements. It's what we're, where the Spirit's trying to move, right. what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to create. I felt so much more comfortable listening to you once I knew that side if that makes i don't know i don't know why i was was telling about i'm like it was the a very pivotal moment for me because i'm like i've you know like you like for people who don't get to see you on wednesdays preach they're missing out you know know, they really truth like like uh, you know there's i think there's a real special privilege for people that show up on wednesdays so if you're listening to this you're not showing me wednesdays plug for wednesday (laughs) i'm just saying is that you there's amazing messages that show up on Wednesdays That's right. and they're not always the corporate, like we are trying, like the, there's uh, some great opportunities and you'll come with some fire sermons. Oh. <laughs> like, like all right. Fire. And that was in those moments. That's when I was like, Oh man, like, cause for someone who's new here, who's an outside perspective, like, like you and Eric look very like, put together. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like it's like, Oh, they've got it. Like, but knowing, like, I have to pray for announcements. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great what Pastor Justin has been teaching. It's that, um, you know, without him, we can do nothing. Mm-hmm. No thing. And we shouldn't even want to, mm-hmm. you know. And so I think, you know, just knowing that at a level, you just want to be where God is, doing what he wants done, and saying it the way he wants it said all the time. And I think, yeah, I think it's um, the more you know, the more you know how much you don't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's, the order of leadership, you know, it's a humbling experience to be put in a role, like you're saying, to even be asked to pray, you know, I mean, especially to start the service, because you're thinking, I'm starting the service, Mm -hmm. and I, this wants, I want this to go where God wants us to go, and it starts with me, Mm -hmm. and having that kind of an attitude is, you know, that's submitted to God, you know, I think that's great. So, we know that you can preach with such anointing and power and love, uh, in the pulpit and also for every little thing you do, including the announcements. And when you're in those closed meetings where you're coaching your team, you're training your team is a level that pushes people to the next level. There's, there's an anointing on you that says we can go further. We can go higher. We can do more for God, not in our own strength, but in, but in his strength, what is it? How do you encourage your teams or the people that you lead to go to that next level? Well, I think it's important that they always know that they're, it's not just, the task they're doing is not just what it's about. Task. <laughs> it's not, I mean, we are text, task oriented because we have things to get done, especially in the helps ministry. You know, you want somebody greeting to open the door, but their job is not just to open the door. Their job is to make people feel welcome and expected. Right. So there's a lot that goes into that and you want them to be ready, but mostly you want them to be led by the spirit. Because ministry happens anywhere you are. And so it doesn't matter if it's at the front door or in the parking lot. I think the helps ministry, if that's what we're talking about, the helps ministry is there to help people get prepared for what God's going to say in the sanctuary. And so everything from the parking lot to their seat is impactful. You know, it's, um, and the way they do that is hearing from the Holy Ghost. You have to be led by the Spirit. That's the number one most important thing I think that I teach my team is to hear from the Holy Ghost. I see in you, coming from someone who sat in some of these meetings with you, there's a vision for the kingdom of God in your heart that probably burns like a fire. Um, and that is what I feel like churns the, the gears on the inside of you to get things moving in the right direction. Um, how do you take that that's burning on the inside of you that's led by the Holy Spirit to the people down, uh, for lack of a better word, downstream that are following you? How do you take that fire and the vision you have for the kingdom of God? Because you see things way bigger, way further along than 
most of us come to the table with, how does that translate? How do you pass that on? Well, I think it has to be done step by step. You know, God every does everything line upon line, precept upon precept, the Bible says. So it's little by little. So you have to like know what the vision is and put that in front of them. But I'd say the number one thing is to always remind people to walk by faith. To take faith into whatever they're doing. So the vision I see of the church at large is to have Christians changing hosp- people who Christians who work in hospitals to change the atmosphere of their hospital, to bring faith to work, and to operate with faith at work. They should be the ones that know exactly what's wrong with the patient. You know what I mean? Because they have the Holy Ghost. Right. So they need understanding of that. So I think it's bringing that kind of an understanding in everything that we do. So that's how we're going to change our community. Is because we're going to be everywhere. And faith is going to be everywhere. And when faith is everywhere, God is everywhere. Because you've got faith in God to do whatever he wants done wherever you are. And so I think I always remind my teams that too. You know, as simple as something, you know, when we've got special meetings going on at church or even Wednesday night for parents. You know, sometimes we don't, sometimes we go long. And I expect right. in, future, in the future we might have some longer services. So what are we as parents going to do? Are we going to bail on the services because we've got to get our kids to bed on time? Or are we going to put faith in God? That if he wants us there, then he'll give our kids extra rest for every hour of sleep. So it's kind of teaching those kinds of things to think on a higher level. Because God himself says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So we can't use the world's thinking to live how God wants us to live. Or else we're going to fall far short of what he wants us to do. We can do much more than we're doing. The church can do much more than it's doing. And I think to always bring them back to the unlimitedness and the goodness of our God. That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. It's great seeing in communities that you have those people that are like, okay, okay, they're, they're, they're tapped into something that is they're doing. And, and they're, they're moving in authority, they're moving in promise, they're moving in scripture, they're doing the right things. And so when I look at you, know, you and Eric, I see that dynamic of like, okay, like it's not just what I see here at church. Right. <laughs> you know, there's right. like, and that's kind of the fun part because I think so much of, of like getting to know people, it's, it's Monday through Saturday. And I say it all the time. Like, what's Monday through Saturday like? That's the sweet spot. You know I mean, <laughs> that's the, the, the heart of it. Because Sunday's easy to throw it on, and like you put a mask on. Unfortunately, a lot of people do that, but you you miss the, what's the real journey of it all, you know. And so I kind of like like you and Eric as, as as a couple in getting here. What's how's that been in terms of like just like the struggles of it? Has it you know was your was your faith always lined up, or like how did you get to where you are now, where you you're walking in the authority that you're walking in? Well, Eric didn't grow up word of faith. Although he grew up in the church, he didn't grow up word of faith. So we didn't grow up exactly the same. Although, you know, he had a wonderful church and a wonderful family. Um, so when we got married, you know, there was still some learning that he that I had that he didn't have. So when we moved to, we moved to Birmingham right out of college. So we were there for three years, Birmingham, Alabama. And it wasn't until after that that we moved to Michigan. Mm-hmm. And then we started um, going to the church that my dad pastors. Okay. So in our married life. So we stayed there for 18, 19 years. And during that 19 years, it was the in and out. That's what people don't understand about Wednesday nights. It's the in and out, the Sunday mornings, the Sunday night services, the Wednesday services, the Saturday women's meetings, men's meetings, whatever. (laughs) Those are where you're growing up. You don't even realize you are because it's just line upon line, precept upon precept. You're just learning as you go. It's like, you know, when you're around a kid every day, you don't notice how much growing up there, but when you're not there, you notice. And that's what I think people don't know. So Eric grew up a lot under my dad. We learned a ton. I credit him with a ton of what we've learned. We went through Bible school, after Bible school mm-hmm. there. We had two Bible schools up there. Um, Eric's been through Dr. Savell's Bible school here. Um, not because you just never stop learning. Mm-hmm. You can right. just never stop learning. And so um, what was the question? <laughs> like, has it has it always been rainbows and skittles? You know what I mean? Oh like, like in terms of hilarious, where are you guys right now? It, it you know again, people always people tend to look at the end result. Yeah, they see you now. They they see yes. like, oh yeah. well, she's they got to put together. He's got a business and blah blah blah. Oh my goodness! But like they don't see like the the, the muck and the mire that it yes. took and the faith and the things that you had to walk through the, yes. the struggles because. People just, they just bypass all that and they go right to like, oh, look at Jerry Savelle, he's doing great with planes. Like, well, okay. 
you didn't yeah. see the starting work, all right? You just see the, the, the end result, and you kind of, you miss the, 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 the faith building, the, the trust, the, yes. the journey with God, the time alone with God. The, <laughs> so that's I the think, part. I think I've told this story before, but when we were in Birmingham, I told Eric, like a year before we moved to Michigan, I said, I really think the Lord wants us in Michigan. We were going to a great church there, and, um, but the Lord started ministering to me about moving. And I said, I think we're supposed to be in Michigan. And Eric was just like, Eric was in a great job. Yeah, and it was a territory job. So he was over all of the Southeast United States working from Alabama. He had a territory there. He was making over six figures. We were like 22, three years old <laughs> making six figures. Life was grand, mm -hmm. right? I mean, as far as the money was concerned. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as spiritually, we weren't at all where we are now. So I told him, I really think we're supposed to move and be a part of the church up there. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah, well, I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put a pin in that. Yeah, we'll put a pin in that and that's, that's our, that later. We'll put a pin in that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, um, over the course of that year, some of the things that happened in our church were, were not, did not go well. The church that we were going to in Birmingham. And so by that following, so a year later, a year later, I said, I've given you a year. Because he said, you know, I've given you a year to think about this. So I really think we were moving to Michigan. And he's like, well, I just don't know about that. And I was like, I just looked at him. And I knew what God was saying. And, and, I, and I almost knew that if I didn't move, I was going to lose Eric. Mm -hmm. So I looked at him and I just said, I move. And Drew had just been born six months prior. And I said, well, I'm moving to Michigan. You can come if you want to. Those are my exact wow. words. Wow. And he, he'll repeat Strong. those exact words too. So he said, oh, okay, I guess I'll come. So, <laughs> so, so he had to leave this great, I mean, he kept the management part of his job, but he didn't keep his territory that he had developed for three years. Mm. And so we moved to Michigan. He had to start all over. Thankfully, we could start developing a territory there. The guy that was over that territory was another manager, and he was letting a manager come into his territory and work. So it was just God worked out all the details. We just had such favor with, with a non-Christian company and a non-Christian manager. And so we started working up there. But, however, we moved in November. Well, if you've ever been to December, if you've ever been to... Michigan's brutal. <laughs> Michigan in November and December and January, it's brutal. Mm -hmm. Especially for a Louisiana boy who's never lived there. Right. <laughs> so our first winter up there, I think it was one... I mean, we weren't even there probably a month, and we had an enormous ice storm. Like, probably the worst one I can even remember, even growing up there. Wow. And so people lost power... I mean, the, the, even though we have trucks to deal with that, it couldn't keep up with it. Um, so I think we lost, we might have even lost, I don't even remember, but it was bad and it was freezing. I think that year it got 40 below, which that does not happen regularly either. So Eric, moving into your ter territory where he had to start over when he was cush, he had developed the territory down there. It was easy. All he had to do was like show up every year now with his clients um, so for him to start over and go back to working hard, he was not very happy. <laughs> we had a little one and he was not happy at all. He would walk into the bathroom every morning, look out the window and say, cloudy again. <laughs> and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, not surprised me. <laughs> oh I'm not goodness. exaggerating every morning <laughs> oh uh, for six months. Cause it's, it's cloudy in Michigan. For, that's how it stays warmer right. is when there's cloud cover. So for six months, he walked into the bathroom every morning and did that. So I, needless to say, our marriage struggle. <laughs> and I mean, I just, I just let him alone. So I wasn't doing well either. It's not like I was encouraging him, probably not even praying for him like I should have been because I was just trying to keep my heart right and serve God and be a good mom. And so we had a serious struggle in our marriage during those years. And, um, but kept going to church. We were in church every Sunday, every Wednesday, you know, and, um, finally came, I mean, it probably was a couple years before things calmed down between us. And so after that, that's when we started serving in the church. Um, Eric had been serving. I think I started, we started serving the youth group was up and running, I think in maybe 2005 and we had moved in 2000 and he started doing worship no it was 2003 we started doing youth he had joined the worship dad wanted him on the worship team he's the best singer on the worship team <laughs> but he didn't take it over to like 2003 and so that's when we really started going into more full-time ministry um, on a volunteer basis everyone thinks they should get paid for ministry I don't even know what that's like 
Right. You know, yeah. most, mo I right. mean, if your heart is right, you just want to serve God. So I tell young people all the time, go get a job somewhere, and then in all your spare time, give it to God. Mm -hmm. You know, just give it to God. That's how I grew up. I didn't care if I was getting paid. The Bible said if you, ca if you will only work for pay, you're just a hireling. Right. And I didn't ever want that to be my heart. So I, we just served, we just started serving in the church and growing and getting better. And the finances were always, Eric's just anointed to prosper. So that's always been on, been on his life. So that's never been a problem for us. But then knowing what the finances are for and then not running after finances, instead mm -hmm. running after God and just letting the finances run after you. That was something he, he experienced revelation on that, and I think that's why he's got such a passion for kingdom builders mm -hmm. because of that. He just knows how that goes, and he knows um, how your heart needs to be toward God. So, no, it hasn't always been easy. And then when you have any children, anyone who's a parent knows you go through different phases with your children where you have to rely on God. So you have to know what the Bible says, what to do, <laughs> and then put your faith in it because for a while you're just doing it blindly. You know, and that's in every area of life, your life. That's how you win in life, is you find out what the Bible has to say about it, and you cling to that word, and you do that word no matter what, and eventually you win, and you realize you won. It just happens because of faith. So, like, when it comes to, like, your Monday through Saturday, you mm -hmm. know, the priorities that you try to focus on, what are those like? For people that don't get to see, like, they only get to see on Sunday, what is your week like? Like, what mm -hmm. are your priorities? So, Monday through Thursdays. I work at JSMI, so um, and HFCC. So I'll, I'll, it depends on where they need me is where I am any given moment. Um, Tuesdays, I'm always at the church. We have staff meetings all day. I have meetings with all my teams on Tuesdays. So that's an all day, you know, kind of like a 9 a.m. to a 5 p.m. type thing. Um, I try to get to the gym and work out. Like Daniel knows, he goes to the brick. And I try to get there. And Hashtag take care of myself. Brag. You know, <laughs> just what I do, you know, trying to be the best me. <laughs> but I'm one of those, you know, get in 30 minutes and get out as quickly as I can, you know. I don't really enjoy exercise. I enjoy the results <laughs> of exercise. Um, and I try to spend time with my family in the evenings. Um, if, if exercise was more like a sport competition, <laughs> what would you do? What sport would you want to play? What sport would yeah. I play? Mm, that's a toughie. Um, I love basketball. I love volleyball, but I haven't played either in years. So, but I heard you were a pretty legit player for basketball. I mean, you know, if you're an athlete, you're competitive all the time. So I have to really watch myself in those areas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think as far as like, so you'll play if you can win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't take me bowling. You'll bore me and I hate it. Golf, I'm trying to pick up because Eric and Drew are so good at it and enjoy it. But most of the time, I take a book and ride in the golf cart. There's also a value there. Right. You know, just encourage day. them on there and it is. enjoy the trip. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> I kind of want to see you play basketball now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, just like losing your witness. Like, what happened there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I also extremely enjoy speed, so I can't be trusted. On go karts or four wheelers, for real? So, uh, yes, for real. Are you so, like a throttle junkie? Yes, a little bit. So, I mean, immensely. Seriously? So, yes, immensely. I got myself in an accident um, a few years ago on four wheeler. What? And, yeah, it was crazy. I did not know she. Like... So, just if you go between here and JSMI, those tire marks <laughs> on the road belong to one person. I told JSMI they should get go karts <laughs> to go from the back field oh of JSMI to HSCC, but nobody I went for it. I love it. <laughs> like, a, who's that speed demon right there? That's just, uh, she's trying to get to the Lord. Uh, yeah, I thought, one day I thought to myself, this is a 40 work. mile per hour road. <laughs> it's way too slow. <laughs> so oh. there's grace for that. <laughs> mercy. Oh. mercy, maybe mercy. That's amazing. Forgiveness. Oh, man. Um... This is like, like, so if someone doesn't know you, like, fresh met you, like, they're like, oh my gosh, this is Nikki, introduction. Like, what would you want them to know about you? Like, what are the, what are the, 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 the key caveats that you would want them to take away from, like, hey, this is the core essence of, of what I try to do and bring? I hope they would walk away knowing I love God and love people. In a nutshell, I think that would be it. I hope they see God on my life. Um, 
Although, you know, I think it's hard sometimes as pastoral staff um, to teach people the word and them not feel con convicted. I mean, you want them to feel convicted but not judged, you know? And so I, I just want them to know I will teach you the truth because I want you to be free. Mm -hmm. And so because the word has been such a huge part of victory in my life, I can't not tell you the word. So anyone who's around me is going to hear the word, you know, and I'm probably maybe sometimes too unashamedly going to tell them the word because it's the only thing I know for sure that's going to work because it's tested and true in my life and it's all I know. So, you know, having been here as long as you have, that the kind of the theme of our church is winning in life, creating yeah. winners in life which is a huge part of everything we put into whether we're doing outreach or in reach or creating a program or doing something like a new podcast or, or whatnot. But I really want to know what does that, what does that mean to you when you see that statement, when you hear that statement, making winners in life or being a winner in life? To me, a winner in life is someone who's just like Jesus, you know, that's anointed, that hears from God, because if that's who we are, Christians, Christian in itself is little Christ-like ones. So if we're just like Christ, we're going to win. There's nothing he didn't do. There's nothing he didn't win. And so to win in life is to be like him. And I think, so he was the word made flesh. So I go back to my last answer and say, if, if you know the word, then it will set you free. And that to me is winning life. That's awesome. That's right. Well, we just want to say, one, thank you so much for taking the time out of your clearly busy schedule to come <laughs> join us today for this amazing conversation. I hope people who uh, get to hear this get to hear your heart for things, because I know they do. Uh, they will, I should say. And I think you're awesome. And like having been here in a short time and getting to experience like your leadership and the things you do, we really do appreciate your time. Thank you for being on this podcast with us and sharing your conversations and your heart. And uh, we can't wait to see you again. Yeah, you will for sure be a repeat guest. <laughs> well, thanks for inviting me. This was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. We are so thankful for Nikki and the conversation. It was truly a pleasure. Take a peek into the show notes and you'll find some of our favorite messages Nikki has preached here at Heritage. And remember, church family, we are just getting started with this podcast. We have so many more great episodes in line for you. Join us again on Friday for our next episode of Winning Conversations. <laughs>